Um, I was uh, I was interested, really. I mean, I was what I was reading about you that you've worked as a uh, a session player. You've worked with quite a, a few people. I've, I've names like Foreigner, Dido, Whitney Houston, people like that. Uh, so my first question is, what are some of your worst and best experiences of working as a session player? Well, I have to say that that work was uh, a, a good long time ago, and um, it was part of my, uh, of course, evolution as a, or a developmental evolution as a musician, the desire to, to want to play all sorts of music and preferably, um, you know, in, in such a way as that um, I could be paid for my efforts. Yeah. Uh, no, no, that's not the primary uh, motivation, but it's, uh, uh, but you know, you can, you can experience all sorts of music as a, uh, uh, as a professional and um, end up skin. So, um, uh, uh, so uh, what were my best and, and worst? Well, they they, they constitute um, the all all the usual things, you know. When that uh, is, when I after I left Jethro Tull, I, I um, I'd been contacted by Jeff Beck to go and join the Jeff Beck band, which I I did for a little while. It was um, uh, rehearsing for a tour, the Flash tour, which he didn't like the album very much, and the tour went no further. But um, um, uh, and it's the usual, this is the long-winded way of coming around to this, it's the usual thing. There's a collection of things that you wish you could impose uh, 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 upon uh, the, the proceedings, you know, to try and get to a, you know, to, to get somewhere with the thing. Uh, or, um, and then there's times that you simply feel that you are too much of a passenger um, to be able to, uh, to uh, to be of much influence. The kind of session player I was, Barry, uh, is that invariably I would go in, they'd play me the demo, and then I'd ask everybody to leave, and uh, which they were on most occasions very happy to. Yeah. I, well, whilst I did everything. Uh -huh. And so, um, you know, I, I often cite the, when I was working with um, Annie Lennox, and uh, she played me her demo of Walking on Broken Glass, Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I tell the story of when I heard the demo, it sounded a bit like Louis Louie to me. Da, 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 blah, blah, blah. Da, da, da. And so so I, I, I proposed, I said, I, I want to do something a bit Stevie Wondery on this. Um, you know, something else. I want to do something else. So they left me to it. Yeah. And, um, and I came up with the, you know, the string, you know, the string riff, if anybody remembers that um, from walking up broken glass. Now, strictly speaking, um, I'd done that uh, under the auspices of being a session player. Uh -huh. but, but in truth, in fact, I had a meeting with Hef, the, um, the engineer, um, uh, the, the what was Steve Lipson, who's the producer of Annie Lennox's Diva album. And I had a meeting with Hef quite recently, last week, in fact. I haven't seen him for a long time. And... You know that would have in in this uh, day and age. You know when you see when you see uh, you know whatever it is, you know a single with twelve songwriters on it, and you wonder, well, what it? It's got two chords and and um and a four four bass drum. I mean, and a pentatonic blues minor scale uh -huh. for a melody. Um, you know what were the parts that were played by these twelve individuals? Uh, well, um, uh, in the case of something like Walking on Broken Glass, I. I formed the the really the substance uh, of, of the thing, but but it's perceived, you know, um, uh, latterly, um, it's perceived as as always the lead vocalist gets <laughs> and the racket that's going on behind is neither here nor there to a good number of people, uh -huh. um, um, uh, but them's the breaks, and um, so I. That's the kind of session player I was. I was always, uh, you know, coming up with ideas and sure. doing things and uh, uh, being influential in that in that regard. But from the standpoint of a hired gun, uh, of course, I am. Um, uh, I, you know, as my career developed and stuff, yeah. uh, I went to, uh, production and songwriting and um, became the um, the architect of my my own fate, one way or another. Okay, yeah, it's uh, fascinating. I mean, I was. Um... Uh, Majesty of Light, uh, I was listening to some of that uh, um, last night in anticipation of this um, interview, and a lot of it has this um, uh, kind of Cuban swing to it, I don't know if you can say Cuban swing anymore, but that sort of thing, and uh, 
um, I'm just wondering, are you specifically, how did that project come about? And are you specifically interested in world music? Well, um, uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's both simple and extreme complexity or simplexity. Um, huh. uh, uh, trying to answer this concisely, I think, of course, or succinctly, uh, is that uh, first of all, there's always there's always strands to our beings, uh, as uh, uh, of course. And as a musician, uh, for instance, when I was in Jethro Tull, the strands to my musical being would be both contemporary music at the time, the way it was developing, um, and and what I, but also what I the the what I love to play, jazz, um, uh, uh, or. That kind of uh, at the time as it was uh, as it was forming, you know, moving away from swing um, and or pure straight what's called straight ahead, and then to forms of fusion and so on and so. Uh, anyway, but all along um, I've been I, I've been I've lived uh, concurrently, uh, and my my mental musical mental being developed in a time that that had Miles Davis in the world. And Bill Evans and Chick yeah. Corea, uh, 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 and those were the people that were luminaries for for me as a as a strand to my being. So uh, when when I met with somebody called Zoe Pollock, who was uh, who, if you remember, was the singer on "Sunshine on a Rainy Day," oh, she sang that. And uh, Zoe and I had been writing uh, commercial music or contemporary uh, music for various artists, and and she she could Zoe could swing. And um, it's it's and you know there's a there's a bit of a there's an aphorism that or or a, uh, something that goes along the lines of it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing uh, and there are people that can swing and people that can't um, uh, and my upbringing through my father's big band was uh, I swung more played <laughs> straight more ba 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 rather than da 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 and so on. So anyway, when when I I spoke to uh, Zoe about this, and we both wanted to try and do something that was I wanted to do a homage uh, in a way to the <clears throat> uh, Miles Davis period of when he met Gil Evans, the great uh, orchestrator, where, um, and uh, this is um, with Bill Evans on piano, mm -hmm. and so much of this is my idea of. Uh, a tribute and thanks, uh, giving back thanks to uh, having lived in a time uh, with that with that music, and also organising a big band. Um, we recorded it. Over, I did the arrangements, and um, we recorded it over two days. Uh, you know that turn the red light on. You know everybody stiffen up. Here, here we go. There's 25 people in a room uh -huh. trying to get it right, and um, and so that's how that was done. And it was it's it's a paying respect to one of the my one of my heroes uh, uh, maybe the greatest hero but i have another he hero of mine uh, somebody called Joe Zawinul but Miles Davis was 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 of course it's easy to say there's plenty of people showing up in my studio and uh, going and i've said to them what's your influences and of course they'll dutifully say something like Joni Mitchell and uh -huh. Miles and then there's no evidence of them ever having listened to Joni Mitchell uh -huh. or, or even knowing who Joey, Joni Mitchell uh, may have been. So this was, uh, I'd, I'd um, uh, whined on about Miles Davis for long enough, for an entire lifetime. So um, it, it became time. And there are some, the, the, there's, uh, you know, Egyptian strut and uh, Cuban Cuban rhythms um, in some of it. But uh, mostly it's, it's that loose-limbed swing, not, you know, there's that, you know, I, I typify it this way. There's that kind of Maynard Ferguson, stentorian, body rich, highly disciplined and tight yeah. in a brass yeah. section. That Miles and Gil Evans could do, which was, I call it, I, I, uh, I, I characterize it as loose limbed. It was, yeah. a, it was a, you know, it wasn't tight, mm -hmm. except it was, <laughs> and it wasn't stiff. Because it was, except it was organised and structured. It's it's Miles was was the exemplar of being able to do that. Anyway. I mean, you mentioned Joni Mitchell um, just off script a little bit. You mentioned Joni Mitchell. Are you are you more of a fan of the jazz fusion stuff she did, 
or are you a bit of an old hippie like myself that likes all that sort of ethereal 60s trilly folk stuff? If you, uh, I, at the beginning of the uh, lockdown, COVID, mm-hmm. um, I did an arrangement. It's on YouTube. I did an arrangement of uh, Woodstock. Uh, I've called it Woodstock, the garden. I've, I've done it all uh, uh, myself. Uh, uh-huh. I sang it and um, uh-huh. the idea it was going to be for a, a smallish ensemble. It's full of chord substitutions and a different mm-hmm. form of arrangement. And I would dearly love to to know uh, yeah, your opinion of um, my efforts in this regard. But anyway, I, I, <clears throat> to answer that question is that when you get on board with an artist, there's a persistence of identity, uh, I believe, that's, that's, uh, that doesn't necessarily take into account mm-hmm. the changing uh, waft and the weave and fashion and voguishness. It's the artistic journey that they undertake. And most often, uh-huh. I'll be able to go and dip into whichever epoch or era that uh-huh. should be. That, that really applies to Jethro Tull too. And um, and most good or great artists, they have yeah. a, an evolution that, um, you know, some form of evolution. And there are periods that you can't necessarily love for the stuff they're doing, it, but that they're doing within that period. But mm-hmm. it has a consistency of identity that you go, I still love whatever this is. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The, 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 some kind of kernel of... Um, wonder or okay. uh, the metaphysical substance of endeavor not not the nuts and bolts of it i don't give a toss uh, well it's uh it's probably sacrilegious to say it but uh um considering Jenny mitchell's version of woodstock and um of course crosby Seals nash young's version my favorite version is the matthew southern comforts uh <laughs> version which is uh, uh probably not the right thing to say but i just love that version of the the song you will barely, then in all likelihood, Barry, you're not going to enjoy my version of Woodstock that much. I will give it a listen. I'm sure I will find it uh, fascinating. It's an interesting song, of course, because Jenny Mitchell wrote Woodstock. I have, have never actually attended Woodstock, really. It's an interesting number, isn't it, really? It's, that's right. And, of course, there is the the mythology that sprung up a, a, around about that, that um, yeah. Yeah, a, a, about the, these, well... This, this also applies to you know longer and more in depth conversation about the notion mm. of the notions of what's imagined as as it were you in that place and yeah. uh, 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 and that too has wonderful um, a zizzly metaphysical substance that uh, that that is out with the the I still think uh, out with the ability of any cognitive function to you know to fully pin down to the either it was that time those instruments those people yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. something you know eternal about it. Well, my next question i think you more or less answered it really you've certainly touched upon it. i was going to say obviously jazz is a huge influence upon you uh, you're in your your father's uh, big band um your jazz fusion group solaris i believe you're in that before jethro tal um, how much does jazz, I think you've kind of answered this already, how much does jazz still inform the way you write or the way you play? It, it, um, it's, a, it, it, it's extraordinary now that when I, when I look back on it, the, I was watching um, um, uh, an interview with Pat Matheny, one of the world's greatest jazz mm-hmm. players, and, um, uh, and he was being interviewed by Rick Beato. And he was talking oh, yeah. about the. It's a wonderful interview, and um, uh, Rupert Beato is uh, absolutely wonderful, brilliant. I think he interviewed. I think he interviewed Joni Mitchell as well, didn't he? I, no, I haven't seen that, and, and and maybe I didn't want to see that because huh? um, because um, maybe I didn't, and um, I don't know if he had. Uh, anyway, you'll know more in this regard. But I was watching the Pat Metheny interview, and Pat mm-hmm. Metheny was talking about uh, himself. In uh, I hope I'm not misrepresenting him here as belonging to some kind of tribe, which is uh, uh, improvisers. Uh, and so the, at the root of all of this, of jazz improvisation is the, uh, I'd have to go to the piano and, and uh, demonstrate, mm-hmm. but at the root of all of these things is that um, when, when I was growing up in my dad's band, we would play what's known as jazz standards. Okay. 
HDR standards, the, the, uh, there were many, many um, interpretations that involved something that jazzers will know about. Maybe you do, uh, Barry, uh, which is uh, chord substitutions. Uh -huh. Substituting the, uh, the harmonic progressions for, uh, for uh, either entirely new chords or, um, or developments of uh, uh -huh. harmonic developments that are you know, um, uh, predicated on the straighter chords of the original composition, okay. um, and this this allows the um, uh, th this opens up the area for improvising over those substitutions, uh, whereby you're no longer uh, constrained uh, by pentatonic uh, blues minor major, uh, you're no longer constrained uh, by modal. Um, uh, well, I mean, it's not constrained by modal. You you, you can be playing in a more mod modal uh, fashion, I should say. So learning modes, learning um, altered chords, yeah, uh, and learning progressions that uh, that that would be known substitutions uh -huh. of, uh, on original jazz standards. So yeah. what it meant to me was it what it means to me is that in uh, from a compositional uh, standpoint. I'm always, it always seems as if uh, to me, I, I, I'm always able to dummy up the next chord in that uh, progression. Um, I remember when I was, I was doing a writing with Julian Lennon, uh, uh -huh. and um, he, he did a, a little uh, a video of promoting one of the songs, actually the album that we did together. And um, he was saying, I always knew the next chord. <laughs> And uh, I was going. That's not true. I didn't know what the next chord is, but I had. I, it, there's nothing knowing about that. Uh, is that well? Ideally, of course, the modern musical landscape is a little bit uh, different because of the, uh, you know, the restrictive nature of, you know, four regulation chords, and you've had your time. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, but under those circumstances, I didn't know what was coming next. But I had. But I had a great. A grab bag of things that I could proffer up that may not necessarily uh, be what you might expect uh, from mm -hmm. the next chord in the progression. It's interesting um, to hear you say that because it reminds me of a, an interview I saw with Richard Wright and he said while they were composing Dark Side of the Moon he stole a chord progression from Miles Davis as a kind of blue while they were putting I think it was Breathe together mm -hmm. but uh, um, a lot of his, what he was talking about went kind of over my head, but it was interesting to hear how much, especially with progressive rock, how much um, jazz influences make their way into that sort of uh, that type of music. That's right, uh, it, it, and it's not it's, it's not just um, there's not a one to one correlation. It's the in in the best of the uh, of uh, of all music, there's a there's an element of what seems to be some kind of freedom and openness to um, uh, openness to uh, what yeah. we come well, it, 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 I mean, it's interesting. I mean, do you see progressive rock as something that was incredibly experimental and welcome at the time as it emerges out of psychedelia in the 60s? I mean, I wonder what your feelings are about, do you think progressive rock kind of um, almost consumed itself by the sort of late 70s? Um, well, I... Uh, it's, this is hard to answer <laughs> because it, I, I couldn't necessarily pin any colours to the master uh, uh, upholding that which I think we were fortunate to have lived through that time that had that stuff. It's typical. Oh, yeah. of, it's typical of our, our species to to want to denigrate, um, uh, you know those things and you know this that currently what we have is better than that I remember I I suffered a little bit in the uh, in, in that uh, arena that realm of endeavor because uh, when when you develop technical skill uh, it's, it's perfectly true that you you're likely to deploy it without without too much thought about its aesthetic value uh, just at that time especially in relation to uh, you know how society going to be a part of the you know that's never going to be a part of your uh, cognition about you know is this is this appropriate for a society uh -huh. never. 
And I remember uh, when, when I uh, fell foul of, of this, uh, this sort of thing, this criticism um, would be at the beginning of the punk era. The, 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 now, what was great about punk was the energy, absolutely great energy. Yeah. I never thought the music was up to much, never thought the music was up to much, but I love the expression and I, I, I admired the, 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 you know, the stentorian, you know, rejection of the shit that had gone on before. Uh-huh. That, that, you know, that's, um, well, that's, that's great. Uh-huh. Uh, I remember watching, uh, it was Rick Wakeman on some kind of um, um, prog documentary going, uh, at the end of it, he's going, yeah, the, it's all overblown and clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. Well, there's some. There's something in between. Not a bland, mediocre thing. There's something in between, uh, which is which is that stuff delivered with yeah. energy and um, uh, with commitment. I say this a lot when whenever I'm interviewed about the great musicians that I admire. Well, that's a life commitment. Yeah, yeah. Commitment in that regard requires giant energy, the ability to withstand the slings and arrows, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of both outrageous fortune and, uh, and of course, uh, that which is pitched at you. Um, when, uh, by the society that, that, you know, that wants to say, yeah, pff, that's all crap, here's something better, or better, because it's simple, you know, this, this thing I talk about, these are values. And, yeah. And uh, if you put it into a, a formal logic, if P then Q, P therefore Q. So if you go, because it's simple, something simple, therefore it's good. So if P then Q, it's simple, therefore it's good. No, these are just values I'm talking about. That's not an actual fact. So it doesn't really no. play a formal logic. But, uh, but, but that's not true. It's simple yeah, yeah. and it's good. Okay. So it can be complicated and it's good, or it's good, and it's complicated, and it's good, and it's simple. No, right. There's no because involved in all of this, in my view. It's getting, it's getting to that, that area where you can do something, uh, that you can do something whereby you're, no, you're not necessarily in isolation. You're just doing this, you know, whatever. You're not in isolation. You're taking account of your life and times, but you're uh-huh. doing what you're compelled to do one way or another. And that's a commitment in energy, in desire, and also having to, you know, having to uh, accept that you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you will be the architect of whatever fate awaits you in that regard. Uh, Some people fall by the wayside, um, never to be heard of again. Others become international stars. Uh, There's no way to... Um, there's there's no way to anticipate how how that's going to play out. You just you, you just keep on keeping on one way or another. Sure, sure. Um, well, I was going to come straight on to. I mean, I've been quite good. I've been chomping at the bit and uh, to want to talk to you about Jethro Tull because I'm a huge Tull fan, as are my subscribers. I was going to. Uh, how do you remember your years with Jethro Tull when you look back on them? Yeah. How do I remember them? Do yeah, yeah. How do you remember them? You know, do you fondly, or or do you uh, have you gone through years of therapy to get over them? <laughs> no, it was uh, very, very fondly, and it's uh-huh. not it's not that floppy hats and brown rice thing. There was much uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth at, at the time that, uh, as you know, Ian was at that time developing this problem with his voice, uh, which, um, you know, I've discussed in, uh, with other people about the idea of when he would say, for instance, in fact, it was on the, the very first tour uh, I, I did with them uh, after making Broadsword and the Beast, and we were, we were in um, somewhere in Germany, and Ian was struggling with his voice then, and um, uh, he said, right, we're going to have to do more instrumentals tonight. And uh, so we did, you know, Bure and Serenator, Cuckoo, uh, yeah. it's called blah, blah. And, um, uh, and I noticed that um, I, even then, and, and, and as young and naive and as I was, uh, I was looking at him thinking, you haven't stopped singing. Because uh-huh. he's overblown. <laughs> he's overblowing, he's blowing the flute. 
putting a huge amount of air through his uh, the, the you know his vocal cords uh -huh. and singing at the same time. Uh -huh. So he wasn't taking a rest. Yeah. So, just playing the flute, he would overblow the Roland Kirk thing. And, and I mentioned to, to him at the time about constantly overblowing, but it became, it's part of his, his being, or certainly was at that time. All these things. All that kind of stuff. That sure. yeah, and, yeah. Uh, if you don't think you're singing by going, what, what? <laughs> then you, well, this is the thing about our human cognition. Much of it takes place in some kind of automatic, you know, uninquired uh, way. But of course, it really hit hard by the time we were touring on, um, uh, what's it, uh, under wraps. And Ian's, you know, first of all, was trying to sing. The technology wasn't up to it. The on-stage monitoring was horrible and loud. And Ian and Pete, you know, loud monitors, flute blowing hard. It was, that was, that was awful for him. However, it was awful for him, uh -huh. um, and I empathised and sympathised hugely. Some of the ways that he went about uh, trying to mitigate uh, this damage that he was continually doing to himself uh -huh. didn't appeal to me much. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and um, I, I think he could have been a little bit more gentle on himself. Uh, mm -hmm. I've said this before about Ian, and I've only... I only have that five years or whatever it was, that, uh, uh, four or five years that I wasn't, I can't remember when or how many years I was in Jethro Tull. But um, my limited experience of Ian is that, is just as I explained, you know, in, in talking about anybody, that's a commitment to being Ian Anderson. Um, yeah. uh, these are the things that he's compelled to do. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the mark of, in my view, uh, one of the marks of a, a great artist. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, uh, recently I was, I was, <laughs> I was really, I was very cheered to see that the zealot gene mm -hmm. um, came flying in at number at number four at the charts, and and uh, has garnered a lot of uh, praise. And, uh, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good on you, Ian. That's a, that's a lifetime of. Brilliant service, amazing service, both to himself and to others. Yes, I mean, in in hindsight, uh, do you think? Uh, I mean, uh, Ian Anson was uh, having these difficulties with his voice during the Under Wraps tour. In hindsight, do you think it would have been best for the band to to cancel some dates or yeah. let him just rest uh, yeah. and then pick them up at a, a later period? I suppose. You know, the the Under Wraps thing was uh, particularly uh, particularly difficult, I thought, because there was the trying to manifest this, you know, nascent technology uh, of the time and having mm -hmm. a fusion between, uh, you know, looking back on it, a, not a very successful fusion between uh, real playing and sequencers and samples and this, that. Mm -hmm. and that. I remember uh, Don Perry playing, you know, the Simmons drum kit. And it's going, oh, God, I hate that shit. Yeah. yeah. And at the time, you know, it's so sterile, and um, and it was a sterile environment that you know, trying to manifest these things mechanistically. Uh, it, it, what may have been a, a you know a good thrust for an artistic development, responding to your life and times, you know, in the early eighties about you know how thing music, uh, you know, commercial music was changing. Um, Ian, Ian being a, an artist that would be cognizant of his life and times, wanted to uh, progress, and uh, or what he might have thought as uh, progress. Ian's quite revisionist uh, uh, about this, as you probably know. As, yeah. as, uh, it was all my fault and everything, but um, uh, but, it, but Ian's desires were uh, were to to move away, to continue to to continue being an artist in whichever uh, decade he found himself in. So, uh, so not necessarily constantly being like Jethro Tull, even uh, you know, because what was like Jethro Tull was prior to me was uh, like whatever was going on prior to me. But yeah. being Jethro Tull would be when I was in the band at that point of the of just artistic progression in co a combination with uh, life and times and the way that music and music provision was changing. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
Uh, but I do, to answer your question then, uh, on the under wraps in particular, I do wish he, as I said, had been a little bit more gentle with him, himself. Yeah. But yeah. who am I? Who would I be to, to say? I, I remember looking at him on that first night. In fact, it was the, the night that I decided that there was no more Jethro Tull for me. And uh, it was the last night, or the one of three nights, and this is the first night, actually, one of three nights at the Universal Amphitheatre in LA. And um, uh, I tell the story of when, uh, I won't go into detail, it, uh, the, we were we play the intro to Hunting Girl. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, does this riff. And Joan Perry, instead of doing the rather more simple, and then Ian presses a, a button that launches the sound of a riding crop, um, mm -hmm. you know, a taped uh, effect, uh -huh. wax egg on the bottom. But uh, Dawn had launched into a kind of polyrhythmic um, drum beat that Ian wasn't expecting, and because uh, Dawn was in front of his home crowd. And, um, and Ian got into the wrong place in the bar. Ah. Uh. And uh, but Ian being Ian, understandably, he's trying to you know carry this now chuntering mass of shit behind him. <laughs> and, uh, 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 but uh, sadly, the chuntering mass of shit was where reality was taking place. And in the meantime, Ian had flipped out and uh, jumped into the um, the audience to berate the um, the, uh, the, uh, the spliff smoking hippies that um, that they were aggravating his throat. You see and. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, to which, uh, and Ian threatened to leave right there and then. Uh, anyway, it was a rather sour experience for me because uh, I'd come second newcomer in the keyboard playing polls and keyboard magazine that year, and I, I was going to be interviewed by um, keyboard magazine. Uh, uh -huh. And of course, after that gig, which was very, very sour, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> So, suffice it to say, there was no. They didn't. They didn't ultimately interview me, and um, and that was a disappointment for a boy from Dundee, as I characterise myself, even though I wasn't born in Dundee. I mean, you mentioned uh, under wraps and and the, and the drum sound on it. Uh, you're probably aware that Stephen Wilson is uh, putting together these uh, this new mix of the Jethro Tull catalogue. He's working. I think Broadsword is the next one out. But there's been some talk about the possibility of them stripping away the drum sound on the Under Wraps album and replacing it with real, more organic drums. I mean, how would you feel about that? And are you a fan of these Stephen Wilson mixes? I, I, Jethro Tull is not a go-to uh, resource for music uh, pr provision as a, as a hobby uh, for mm. me. I'm, I'm hugely, I'm in great admiration of, of Ian's, you know, his thing, but it's, it's not, uh, it's not, I don't listen uh, very much uh, to Jethro mm. Tull. Um, uh, so I can't c uh, comment on that. I've, I have thought that simply replacing drum machine with a, a real a real bloke, in many ways, it's just the same as what happened then, which is, isn't this the thing we do now? Uh, yeah. in this day and age, you know, you take off the machines and you put somebody real on and then it's better. Well, yeah. Um, that's in your life. That's in your life and times. Uh, if that's what, and, and certainly, I think almost anything could be a sonic improve, improvement upon the miserable fucking lindrum that it was. <laughs> and also having a, um, uh, you know, an, a, a qualified engineer, Ian and I, but mostly Ian would be engineering, uh, you know, mm. much of that. And uh, well, it doesn't sound good. It never sounded good at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was neither fish nor fowl. It was neither high tech nor nor fusion enough to sound uh, wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that was at the time. But I mean, uh, this this is de you know de rigueur. You know, take all that machine shit off and then mm -hmm. put real people on it. Then it's good. <laughs> just, that's just a, a period of time. Maybe in who knows the mm -hmm. way in 40 years time or whatever it is they'll be going let's get all these humans back off and get some AI <laughs> going under wraps then it'll be good that's just uh, uh, it's not to say that it couldn't be uh, uh, good I've already said that it, it, it wouldn't take much to make it sonically better that's for sure but yeah. does it make it more appropriate for life and times I don't know
Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know, and and I think that would be for uh, those that that are, you know, there's a commitment uh, by an artist, of course, but I've, I I think there's a feedback loop here, a commitment by the audience to that artist to the artist. Yeah, so if, yeah. If that's if that does it for you, Barry, and um and many others, uh, 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 then uh. I, I doff my cap to um, the fella that um, I, I'm sorry I've forgotten his name. That's going to be Stephen Wilson. Um, I, I do apologise. Uh, so uh, if you can make it sound better, he's got my vote. Well, uh, I'd be interested in in, in a, a new mix because uh, I think some of those '80s albums they they haven't seemed to have aged well. They don't. Some of them just sound very affected and and uh, a bit plasticky. I think some of it. That's right. The, the, even at the time, you know, uh, as I said at the beginning of the interview, the, 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 you know, a, any musician has many strands, many strings to their bow with the yump team things. And, and from a mechanistic standpoint, let's call it that anyway, at that time, my influences would have been something like Yellow Magic Orchestra. Uh-huh. Uh, Thomas Dolby, I've talked about Thomas Dolby in the popular idiom. Um, or uh, Kraftwerk. These were the people at the forefront of that kind of technology. But those were good sounding albums. Uh-huh. Uh, when we when we did, um, um, for instance, Ian's Walk Into Light album and later um, uh, on the Raps, I don't think they sound good. But they don't sound they don't sound good because of an objective high bar as to how it should sound. Is yeah. that what I'm, I'm saying to you is that. Uh, there are there are these epochs that we go through. For instance, you will know that um, that coming out of the certainly out of the mid to late seventies into the eighties, the idea that that you would lift a lot of the you wouldn't have huge amounts of bass on something. You'd lift the the low end because that's hard energy to broadcast any uh-huh. uh, great distance over F, uh, FM. Yeah, and, um, and so I'd remember that you know the 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 uh, you know all the all those mixes that are so clamped in their uh, dynamics they're just zizzly and the the reproduction bandwidth there's nothing below you know I don't know what would it be nothing below eighty or hundred hertz yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know and uh, lifting all the the bottom end and then this zizzly horrible twelve k uh, top end you know mm-hmm. and then an anti a, 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 a Nyquist filter. Uh, on even uh, samples, even the samples when Ian and I did uh, Walk Into Light, there was a Nyquist sample on the original um, uh, em- Emulator 1 and Emulator 2, mm-hmm. um, you know, that, and that was compounded 12-bit, so, so-called compounded 12-bit. It didn't sound objectively that good anyway <laughs> to begin with. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And they were being, they were being performed in a... Um, in a time of a musical development and a societal development where this squashed, you know, tiny little squashy rock sound was, was that with which you had to comply or out of the pool. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. so that, that all, all of this is, is explainable largely yeah. by the fact these are, were the life and times that both Ian and I went through. I saw in uh, was it the Ballad of Jethro Tull, uh, Ian was explaining in print, and there's a Russian proverb that I think is uh, is interesting to, to to acknowledge here. There's a Russian proverb proverb that says, "Think it, don't say it. Say yeah. it, don't write it. Write it, don't be surprised." Anyway, it's written according to Ian that the Tull fans didn't like me in in because I was too Scottish. <laughs> What was the what was the other thing? And a bit eighties, and uh, I was thinking, well, uh, hang on, Ian, that was the eighties. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I get the impression with Ian Anson that he very much calls the shots, really. Uh, I, I think, but he, he seems to have been revising a lot of these these versions of the band's history recently. Um, well, uh, uh, you know, um, who knows? Because uh, uh, because all of these, uh, you know, all human, uh, you know, congress is is conducted largely in by mm. metaphor, and there's a narrative that mm. uh, a narrative's 
crops up that that we begin to cling to the narrative and the actuality because it would be the same for me there will be there will be um yeah. in fact in, uh, uh, inconsistencies in anything I've said because m- mine is a narrative too I remember I remember now as me now back then I thought it was great when yeah, yeah. I the hotel and I loved Ian and Martin and Dave and Jerry and Dawn uh-huh. loved them all um, I Ian was, I give thanks. You've probably seen me give thanks. I, you know, I can't keep continually give thanks. Yeah, yeah. But, but Ian plucked me, as I said to Janice Long, um, rest in peace, I said to um, Janice Long, I was back in the early 80s, I was being interviewed on Radio One, I'm a conversation musician, and Janice Long had said, uh, asked me about this, and I said, well, Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull plucked me from nowhere and overnight, yeah into total obscurity and, uh, and, um, and she you know she I don't know if she she got the, um, uh-huh. uh, the the poking fun at the whole thing but the at the time as a young as a young whippersnapper uh, mm-hmm. I, I would be you know I, I would be a bit of a nightmare I suppose to to, to contain and uh, I'd had my own desires anyway within Jethro Tull uh-huh. um, uh, but uh, me now, looking back then, I I'm so grateful uh, to yeah. how uh, I I I say I I I couldn't have been the musician that I am now mm-hmm. if I'd stayed in Jethro Tull. Sure, sure. Um, one of my subscribers has asked, um, uh, incidentally, for what it's worth. I mean, I love the uh, the keyboards and stuff on uh, Broadsword that album, but. Uh, one of my subscribers has asked, um, uh, "What equipment, what rig or equipment were you using on broadsword, especially the the clasp?" Um, so I have to say that um, uh, you you will know the the lineage of of, of this stuff, which was after the making of A mm-hmm. with Eddie Jobson. Ian was yeah. particularly um, taken by uh, Eddie and uh, and the first polyphonic synthesizers were, were coming about. Eddie was um, a master of the Yamaha CS80 and Ian was particularly taken uh, uh, with this. And uh, so Ian had started um, working and, and developing ideas for Broadsword. I came down from Scony Botland to audition for Jethro Tull. Oh, yeah. So, so when I auditioned for Jethro Tull in, in Paul Flea's, mm-hmm. uh, Martin and Dave for the first time, and I, I think it was a sodding drum machine, and um, um, and I would start noodling about in the style that Ian had already um, developed largely as a evolution of what was happening on A. This is my mm-hmm. understanding of it. So I, I I cottoned on to this as a um, stylistic or or as a thematic trend in mm-hmm. compositional desires and stuff. So I started developing those things. I'm, um, you'll see I'm a sort of, not co-writer, but additional material yeah. on um, a Broadsword. Uh, Ian, Ian's narrative is that I didn't do Broadsword and that I came on for the Broadsword tour. Uh-huh. In fact, I played on all of Broadsword. And yeah. the, the equipment was, Ian had a, a Roland Jupiter 8, very early polyphonic synthesizer. Mm-hmm. Um and he had, a, I loved it, a uh, um, Roland ProMars and a Roland Compu. It was the four, four note polyphonic uh, Roland. Um, uh, so it was largely, say, the clasp. Yeah. Uh, w- it would be a Jupiter 8 and a Roland Vocoder. I can't remember which one it was, the 505. Uh-huh. Um, that had this funny kind of, you know, is that is that somebody singing or is that just a mental breakdown? And um, but uh, but broadsword was uh, when I look back, I, I'm not terribly fond of um, certainly not under wraps. Compositionally, I thought there were some good things on under wraps and uh, and on walk into light, but I'm not terribly fond of the sound. So, but that's not the music. No. This is. This is the uh, I, I'm, do, I'm in doing a postgrad um, 
degree in philosophy, Barry, I should, I should mm -hmm. uh, split my time between um, uh, studying philosophy and uh, and being a, a try, or at least trying to be a musician. And okay. uh, 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 so, so um, uh, where was I going with that? Mm -hmm. uh, train of thought um, um, is that those the broadsword and the uh, and the beast had a good combination of I thought the tech and uh. the animal combo was good. There was a crucial item there, and he doesn't yeah. get talking about much. It's Paul Samuel Smith. Uh -huh. Paul Samuel Smith produced that. And Paul Samuel Smith at the time, and I've worked with Paul recently because um, I went back to, uh, Paul was producing um, a couple of Cat St Yusuf Cat Stevens albums. A few years ago, I, I went to play on, on these and work with Paul again after all this time. And uh, I, I, understood, I understood Paul's form of production to be something more like curating getting the right elements, uh, you know, to, for this exhibit. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought the balance on uh, Broadsword was good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought the zizzle of, um, of Ian's um, um, response to his life and times, and then with the, maybe the energy that I could bring to the band as a young whippersnapper. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was good. Uh, and when I listened back to Broadsword, I think that's that good. That subsequent albums, uh, it, certainly when I was in the band, subsequent albums weren't quite so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, Paul Samuel Smith played a crucial role there. No, no. Off the front line a little bit, or at least Ian relaxed a little bit and allowed Paul to just curate in a way that uh, that I think, looking back, was was highly beneficial. Mm -hmm. I think this is, you know, point of view constructivism, Barry. I mean, yeah. this is yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, think, <laughs> I think a lot of Tull fans uh, from I uh, tend to see Tull losing their way a little bit after uh, Brought Up and the Beast, and then coming back to the that more classic, what you can call that classic Tull sound around about sort of eighty seven, eighty eight. But you had a you had a hand in when I uh, it was um, um, because I. Without going into too much detail, Barry, is that there was a lot of ill feeling um, that would percolate around uh, all of us, really, about still about um, you know previous band members, uh, you know, and, and I don't know anything about it, but previous band members thought they were dismissed, um, you know, as a perfunctory uh, kind of dismissal, and after all, it was a good service, blah blah blah. So there was a, there was there tend to be a, 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 a an atmosphere. There was some kind of atmosphere uh, uh, surrounding this, and uh, that um, I probably when I left Jethro Tull, I'd had a, I'd not had enough. What's the what's the I just wanted to go and uh, Dick Whittington, yeah. you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. The streets are paved with gold, and try and play with all these people that I've subsequently played with, and produced, and written for, and. You know the whole schmeal, um, and mm. I've had a very charmed and privileged existence. As yeah. far as I'm, I'm not blowing my own trumpet here, this is just <laughs> how it's played out. I'm, I'm, I, I was largely a passenger in terms of one thing to the other. So, so um, um, uh, but uh, when so there was a, a, a bit of a pull and ill feeling. Maybe <laughs> this is the truth. And but the, I think Ian did he call me up. I can't remember, but he called me up and I was so happy to go back mm -hmm. to see him again. Yeah. I don't think, but to toast his good health and yeah. he, toast his good health yeah. to uh, make sure if I could, through my efforts, uh, the way that I do, to let him know that I love him. Yeah. Um, um, the way that, you know, and I've talked about this before. We're men and everything, you know. That you, don't yeah. find, you, don't, you don't really say this, and you know, Ian, I, I, I love him, and um, uh, but that doesn't mean to say carte blanche and everything he does wonderful or vice versa. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, so um, uh, over over the years, of course, my gratitude is because the other thing that Ian. Um, was was for me was a phenomenal mentor. Yeah, of course, I bet. I bet. Kid, 
from, uh-huh. from you know the smart mouth and a, a and an ability to play anything that he put down in front of me, and um, uh, uh, you know um, that's that's the that, that changed the course of the direction of my lifetime's travel. Mm-hmm. What am I going to say about somebody that was that that showed me photography, yeah. philosophy, uh, art, aesthetic? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, absolutely. Oik, uh, you know, Anoik from from the Scottish Highlands. Uh, oh. Anyway, I was uh, speaking to uh, Don Airy, of course, who who plays with uh, Deep Purple now, and I, I couldn't help but ask him about his time with uh, Jethro Tull, and he said to me that uh, Ian Anderson is an absolute genius, but nobody is happy in that band, <laughs> which I thought seems to perhaps play out considering the amount of lineups uh, Jethro Tull have been through over the years. Uh, the way I typify this, I think that's a good, I, I think that's a fair summation by Don Airy, is that, um, but you know, it's it's the human condition to whine, isn't it, about, you yeah, know. Yeah, absolutely. Complaining is good for the soul, I think. That's right, and there's a, the, 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 it's known as venting uh, one way or another, you know, um, uh, at, you know, d- during some of my time, I would have to vent. You know, I remember I went out, it was in Australia once and um, with Jethro Tull and was, he, all that Ian was going to be talking about was bloody salmon farming. And, I, I, you know, and and uh, uh, and then I thought that at the time he had um, a bag man that would get, you know, lift Ian's bags uh, from the airport carousel, but left all the rest of the band's bags dragging around. And very mine had burst open. And um, uh, so, so, it, so I used to think this guy that was Ian's bag man was a bit of a sycophant. Uh-huh. So I, I went out in uh, in Australia and got a T-shirt made up that said "Sick of Fish." <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I was coming down the stairs somewhere, and uh, and Ian he was in bad shape that day, and uh, seeing this "Sick of Fish" T-shirt, but it was a, a form of venting. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's it, it's it's what it's what happens in bands. It, it, you know, yeah, there's yeah. No, it's not it's not all let's get together and you know, back slapping fab. If there's yeah. no rub, there's nothing happening. Rubby nonsense. And sure, Ian's heart was a hard taskmaster, and Ian was hard to satisfy. But yeah. he always said, but he's very demanding about his own self. Sure, he wasn't, he wasn't just being a a twat. Uh-huh. Uh, this is this this is uh, his own demands upon his own performance, upon sure. his own um, vision of himself under those circumstances. And I, you know, the, again, this is opinion, as you know, seen from uh, you know the outside. Ian might explain it differently, but I didn't see it any differently. Mm. Demanding of himself, demanding of others, occasionally unreasonable. We've seen mm. that. Uh, well. Uh, hang on a sec. Does that does that describe almost every human being on earth? Mm. Mm. Just played out at a, a, a very high level, and on, on times, you know, in a sodding tour bus where nobody's getting off, <laughs> and, uh, and that can be, you know, that can be tricky. So the, stand, so the standards he, he had for himself, uh, he held everyone to. He held himself to as well. I think so, and yeah. and. That, I, I remember there was days in Germany when I when I and this is true. Uh-huh. It, I'd come I'd come onto the plane in the morning, uh, you know, after the gig, and Ian would be there with a face like thunder. He'd be listening to straight out the back of the monitor desk, or straight out the back of the mixer desk. No applause, no live. Listening to the raw, dry versions of drums, keyboards, and bass, and all the rest of it. Yeah. You know, the full and being, you know, so upset with, uh, you know, whether it be mistakes or lack of energy, or, yeah. you know, and so on and so forth. And um, that uh, that's hard. That, that's mm-hmm. hard. It, I mean, the sense of foreboding of, you know, having to walk down the aisle uh, past Ian, mm-hmm. it's like thunder and wondering, is this, oh, is this me? I'm going to get... I'm going to get the bombs rush now. Yeah, I played like an absolute toss bag last night. Not intentionally, uh-huh. but you know, the stuff is demanding enough. And um, 
delivered with a great deal of zeal or zealotry, as, as you might <laughs> say. <laughs> well, um, I only have one question for you. It's a question I ask everybody really when I interview them. If you could collaborate with somebody, um, uh, who would you most like to collaborate with? Uh -huh. that's, a, that's a toughie. <laughs> We're mostly all dead. Um, well, we can go down that road if you want, a kind of a fantasy sort of idea, if you could collaborate. I mean, you're going to say Miles Davis, aren't you? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be um, Klaus Ogerman for me. Um, okay. Klaus Ogerman, the brilliant string arranger, composer. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, myself, here's the band, myself, Klaus Ogerman, um, uh, let's, let me let me see. Let's get this. Let's get this right. No, I think uh, I think it would just be me and Klaus Ogerman and um, a seventy-piece um, orchestra. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. I wish you the best of luck, and hopefully we'll speak soon. We'll speak again one day. I hope so. And thank you very much, uh, Barry. Very uh, very insightful and good questions. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.